welcome to the Art Now speaker series. This is the first of the season. Um, our guest today is Sandra Meggs. Um, I wanted to say something. I was thinking about what I would say as far as prepping you for the work, and I thought that's not really, she'll do a better job of that. And at dinner today, I was saying that the only thing I, I felt like I wanted to say was that it's always really exciting when a new body of, of her work comes out. Um, it's always a kind of exciting surprise. And it actually, maybe that reveals how difficult it would actually be to summarize what she does. Um, because everything that comes out seems to be coming from uh, a whole new place, um, which it may not be at all. We'll, maybe we'll find out. I'll give you a little bit of background, and then we'll turn it over. Sandra Meggs was born in Baltimore in 1953. She studied at the Rhode Island School of Art and Design, received her BFA at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in 1975. She went on to receive an MA from Dalhousie in 1980. In addition to her numerous shows at Susan Hobbs in Toronto, she has exhibited at the National Gallery of Canada, the Power Plant, the Vancouver Art Gallery, and the Art Gallery of Ontario. Internationally, her work has been exhibited at the Bologna Biennial, the Fifth Biennial of Sydney, and the Fordham Museum in Amsterdam. Her work has been a subject of countless reviews and publications. She has lived and worked in Canada since 1973 and has been teaching at the University of Victoria for over 25 years. Please welcome me, uh, help me welcome Sandra Meg. Um, give this a second to warm up. It takes about 10 seconds to turn on. how that actually sometimes works. Um, I don't know if you want to put that on or hold it or stay close. Um, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I was playing you recordings from Deep Space, from the Space Voyager that uh, NASA recorded. And I'll link back to that at the very end when I tell you about the gong. Um, I'm going to run through about 20 years of selected works. And I'm going to try my best to keep it to an hour. Um, let's see. This is my studio. I thought you'd like to see uh, a space that I have made um, a lot of the work in. I've been here for about eight years now in this studio. So my work does um, change its visual form from piece to piece, as you will see. I think what unites all of the work is it's coming from a very um, base, personal level in my life, and I'm not very shy about talking about that. Um, I also often, but not always, research a work through reading or travel, and um, most often all the work has a very clear formal structure that um, functions as a model for something in the world. And this visual formal structure also, I feel, allows me a kind of play where I allow my weird um, sense of humor to function in a very visual sense. And I've always really admired um, the stand-up comic uh, who has an affinity for verbal play that I, I think some of this work is a kind of visual play in a, in a, in a different way. Um, just to, okay, so in 1993, I'm gonna begin. This is a work that I made called Baby. 
And um, at the time in 1993, I had a three month old infant daughter. And prior to the whole child delivery thing, I had planned, I mean, I knew I would have a baby, but I planned a trip to um, Mount Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon out west in Arizona and Utah. And my vision was the baby would be asleep and I'd be happily drawing away out in the landscape, which is a way that I uh, like to work a lot. Um, so the baby, who's 22 now, so she's a healthy grown person, but at the time, uh, she was what's called a wakeful child and she rarely slept. And that meant that I was constantly exhausted and actually had a great fear of being so exhausted that I would drop her and kaput. Um, so on this trip, I ended up, rather than painting, I wrote um, a poem of lyric because I was listening to a lot of country western music. And the form of the work allowed me to pursue visually this uh, fantasy vision that I had of um, young motherhood. So um, I'm just going to read you the, um, the text. So these are, uh, let's see, um, 24, 26 inches high. And well, you can see from the scale, I guess, how, how big they are. And then at the bottom middle of each panel, there's a text. And the way they were constructed was a painting was done to correspond to the text and finished. And then the next painting was done to run on to sort of continue the visual space of the first painting. So I'm just going to quickly read the text panels on these. I was up inside the canyon when I saw the baby's face. Never plant the seed if you're expecting grace. Crying time, it's crying time. Crying time again. In the rocks I see her face, but then the river floods the place. The rock is tall and I so small. Muddy waters change in all I know. I looked in the face of my little child. I held her close to see her smile. But balance slipped, I lost my grip. She weighed eight pounds, she hit the ground. A rock so high, nothing can climb it, not even a bird can fly to find it. And down the cliffs to the river fall, but rise the water to that high wall and takes back all it left behind, takes it back so I can't find my baby. If only she would suck like other babies do. If only she would sleep like a baby too. With the drop of a hat or a key down a grate, I lost her like that with the slip of fate. I tripped and fell, my arms flew out, the baby too. The rest of the story is not up to you. She hit the ground and that is that. I went to the river and thought I'd jump in. Her smiling face stopped me again. Smiling face or crying time, it's sure to make me feel alive. I think I got one ahead of myself, so I'll just skip. Um, over the head, on top of the clock, beside my bed, on the canyon walk, I know you won't mind if it's crying time. And then the last panel read, woo, 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 boo, hoo, hoo, woo, 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 oo, oo, oo. And um, as you can see, this last panel, it's the ultimate splat of mess beside the um, rose-covered cottage. I mean, it was the ultimate downer of a happy baby genre thing. <laughs> but, um, it was, uh, for, me, for me, it was very funny. And um, actually a composer was inspired by the poem and he wrote um, an operetta, a modern operetta. His name's Bob Becker. He's a um, 
modern composer in Toronto, and um, so that exists now too in composition. Um, after Baby, so this is Canadian, 1994, and um, the form I chose for this work was a repetition of 24 inch square canvases um, with a text card. You can see at the bottom there, this yellow, yellow disc. And um, so I was like um, a year into motherhood and reading a lot of children's books and changing a lot of diapers. And I fathom myself as a fictional artist. So all of these texts are um, about a kind of fantasy life, but based on somewhat biographical, I guess. So, um, so this is 24 by 24, oil on linen. And this text that you see Um, at the bottom here, I'll read it. Um, it's called Adventure. It's called Canadian. We are in danger. There are strange obstacles in the road. We will use cunning strategies to get us through. We will be better for it in the end. And actually, I don't know if any of you recognize this, but it's from the um, Hasty Taxi Cab Golden Book story. <coughs> And this is uh, sensitivity from um, Puss in Boots. Do you recognize the cat putting on his boot? I own a pearl necklace. I like cats, expensive perfume, and flouncy floral fabrics. I have had a wide variety of sexual experiences. <laughs> This is called Drinking, and it's a, from a Bavarian um, little village town illustration, Drinking. I know if he finds the dishwasher carton full of empty bottles, he'll know about my drinking problem, so I keep the basement door locked. It's too messy to go down there, I say. And Sleeping. When I am sleeping, I am always beautiful. And this, of course, is Sleeping Beauty. And um, a few other images there. Um, this was from a children's prayer book, a golden book, where she's looking up at the heavens, and it's very beautiful, but I just saw a slimy sky of poo up there. So. She's very comfortable in it, though. Um, so I'm moving on to 1996 and a series called Dummies. Um, I stumbled upon this form of... Um, these mylar um, framing devices where if you reflected light up into the work, the, the, the paintings would shimmer onto the wall. And um, I became very interested in portraiture and family, my own uh, like portraits of my family that I barely had any memory of around the same time that my brother very tragically had committed suicide. And this led to this kind of very um, much darker work in my life uh, called Dummies. And um, the way I constructed these paintings was to actually build physical models in my studio out of um, garbage bags and towels and um, brooms and medicine bottles, cats, 
and just to embed uh, spatial features in them, and then to portraitize them in these, um, I don't really think of them as grotesque, I think of them as like an exploration of materiality in reference to um, the physical body and um, stages of um, life and transformation of the body. So um, that this was the result of that. And by some experimentation, I had discovered these lights to project light up into them as if you were holding a flashlight under your face. So it did kind of mimic uh, a bit of that kind of gruesome acting that you might do on a, a scary night or something like that. But um, they're all very, very highly visceral. This is all oil medium of, va of various things. And um, I was also, this is a detail shot of um, this painting. So they have these very highly, highly worked up surfaces. It was kind of, kind of a frenzy of um, painting activity. At the same time, they were portraits and um, you could discern um, humanity in them. And these were all also an exploration in scale because I had different um, scales of these um, panels, which was a bit of a departure from the repetition of the previous series. Um, getting out of that kind of difficult phase of my life, um, in 2001, I had a wonderful opportunity to visit a uh, very, very remote location in Clackwood Sound in British Columbia in um, Hesquiet Harbor, a place called Boat Basin Farm. And this was so remote that the only access was by boat. Oh, and it took maybe five hours to get there. Uh, there has been a book written about the foundation called To Granny's Garden. And um, the, sorry, this isn't a very good image, but it kind of just gives you a, an indication of the location. Um, and so I s had the opportunity, it was kind of an artist residency that had been organized by a friend of mine, Tak Tanabe, who was friends with the um, overseer of the site. And it was a historical site. It had a very, very rich um, history to it. And um, it was a paradise of landscape that was surrounded by clear cut because there were secretive um, forestry industries all around it. And that was kind of part of the um, experience because we took tours into those places as well as spending all of our time in here. So immediately upon um, my immersion in this landscape, I came upon an um, idea of it as a model of entering a consciousness deep, deep, deep within a psyche. And I even did a drawing of that as a map. So as if I could explain it a bit, you would land on the shore of the beach. You would proceed up the steps to the lodging, which was a sprawling kind of mouse and rodent filled hovel of a beautiful space. And it was very primitive, but it was just awesome in its majesty. Um, and through this lodge, uh, there was a long walkway through this kind of space that you're seeing um, that was um, mostly wood, wooden pathways. And then you came to a gate. And through the gate, there was a pergola that was uh, constructed. And through the pergola, you kind of entered a very magical garden. And the woman had uh, dahlia beds and um, exotic um, West Coast plantings and rhododendrons and little Japanese gardens and there were just kind of magical things everywhere. And you could find your way through that garden to um, a rear gate, which was kind of secretive. And through the rear gate, there was an even more hidden pathway that went up a, a ravine 
that followed along a, a white pipe that led down from Ray Lake that was the most pure lake that was the water source, the drinking water source for everyone on, on the um, property. And I had imagined going to Ray Lake where I did go and um, went uh, skinny dipping. And I imagined it as an um, enlightenment experience, that it was a purity of um, the soul. And so I brought this whole um, experience into a work that was called The Newborn. Um, so it had, the newborn itself had this structure. There were 12, 24 inch panels, and each panel was a verse in a fairy tale that I had written myself. That was kind of the awakening of a young girl through her pathway in the forest. And um, the installation of the work was that the gallery was painted this um, very earthy uh, brown. And you can see these kind of ghost-like halos on the wall that are rectangles behind the painted panels. And my idea was that the, um, the gallery had had a prior existence for some other time. And then these paintings were then um, giving it another life. So that, that was part of it for me. Um, all of the paintings had little tiny lights in them and a panel card to the right uh, relating the text and then a yellow picture <coughs> lamp. And um, that was all part of my trying to put you in the mind of the intimacy with that um, landscape that I had experienced. So I, did, I didn't put every panel in here, but I'll just read you some of them so you can get a sense of what that narrative was all about. Um, this is called uh, The Ancient Tree Trunk. She had been walking for so long that her beloved red shoes began to shake her feet where her brown socks had worn through. Sleep was all she wanted, but the dampness in the dark ground and the sounds of breathing in the trees forbade her stopping. She discovered an opening in the cleft of an ancient tree trunk and said, may I sleep inside you tonight? Um, the brown coat. She took off her purple canvas cap and hung it on the nail beside the bed. She took off the lavender flower print dress, folded it, and placed it neatly at the bottom of the bed. There was an old brown coat lying in the corner, and she put that on over her white satin slip, tying the belt as tightly as she could around her waist. And um, a lot of these paintings had um, very specific attention to detail in parts of them. And um, I really, really wanted the intimacy of the viewer to get that close into the work that you would be sort of compelled um, to notice the buttons on the coat or, or the pattern or something like that. Um, the chain. The Robin family then happened there and stole the girl who held a beautiful dahlia she had picked from the dahlia bed. The robbers feared nothing, for they were compelled by greed. The robbers put her in chains and fed her the fat of many sacks <coughs> of downy woodpeckers to fatten her up. The robber daughter took a liking to her and made her sleep in bed with her. The robber daughter had a big, sharp electric carving knife in the bed. She kept it under her pillow. Um, this again is an example of the details in the paintings. Mind you, um, this painting is 24 by 24, so this area is quite small. And then this is oil on panel. The earthquake. The girl gave the dahlia to the little robber girl. The robber girl had never been given anything before and was surprised at the happiness she felt, for she had usually felt miserable. 
In the goat shed, the robber family kept a great black bear tied in chains. That night, the little robber girl unbound the bear and the girl. And here are two loaves and a ham for you, so you won't be hungry. The black bear put the girl on his back and flew up above the ground where they hovered for some time. There was an earthquake below them which swallowed up the house with all of the robbers in it, even the little robber girl. And during my um, experience there, I was sitting drawing in the forest and a bear approached me. I was alone. And the bear got so close, I could feel the breath on, you know, on my face. And um, it was just an amazing nature experience. And I just yelled, go away. <laughs> and he did. So, <laughs> But you could see uh, deep purple, like, bear scat everywhere. And there was blueberries in the fields and everything. So. That's what, that, that's what that was about. I was in the way of the blueberries. Um, the power. The hairy, pungent black bear was very kind to her. He told her how to find the gate. I can give you no greater power than you possess already. Don't you see how great that is? Don't you see how humans and animals are obliged to serve you and how you get on so well in the world? It consists of this that you are a dear, innocent child. And with that, he dropped her spousely on the ground and flew away. Um, so this is a detail of that gate that you see in the center of the painting. And this is just a, a close-up shot of it, which is probably about that, that far away. Um, and then there's this flower um, bed with a light coming out of it. And I think this is the last um, one I have. Um, the satin bonnet. As she looked up above her head, the sky filled with boys. They were playing with each other, and the noise of their shouts and laughter filled her ears. One boy came down upon her. He liked her hair the way it blew in the wind. He gently pulled it back behind her ears and then placed a yellow satin bonnet on her head. She looked into his eyes, and he into hers. Um, that was a newborn. I uh, had a bit of a departure around 19, or 2004. And um, I wanted to make work that was textless, that had no um, associated uh, narrative or uh, words. So I did a, over a period of three years, I did bump, ride, and its, I-T-S. So these were very um, varied in scale. This particular one is um, two feet by three feet. And some of them were eight feet high by four feet wide. So I'll show you some of them. and. Um, they just um, were very, very playful uh, visual um, forms with um, still on a childlike theme, um, as you see here. Now, this is a more of a, a complex painting te technicality um, in terms of how they're constructed. But um, basically, this is oil paint with wax over layers and layers and layers of gesso that is the means for building up this kind of um, refined surface texture that's the picture in itself is deeply embedded in the surface of the painting. So the first ones are bump. And then um, the ride paintings uh, were still only the, the two colors, one color with white. This is called Girl Kissing Duck. I did start titling them. This is called Boy Kissing Girl with Rabbit on His Head. 
I don't know why I do so much kissing, but um, this is just a little sketch to show you the planning process for the painting. So you can see that even within the white areas of the canvas, there are images embedded, which are very hard to photograph. So they are in there. This is called um, Girl Pulling Swans by Neck. Uh, squished brown clown. Um, squished green clown. This one's eight feet high. And I forget what they're all called. Girl kissing horse. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of kissing, aren't you? Um, so then the final um, bunch of them are it's, and they were two, uh, three, three uh, colors. So playing more with the color. Um, okay, so as part of this departure more into the uh, form, the pure uh, visual form without uh, narrative, I um, and this I'm showing you this image because I wanted to show you sort of the the background behind and where things can generate from. And um, I had held on to this picture for um, uh, 17 years, because my daughter made it, I think, when she was two in um, daycare. And I just loved it. I don't know if I was in love with her or in love with this. I, I mean, it was just beautiful to me. So um, the result of my reverie for this image was a whole work called The Fold Heads. And um, The Fold Heads was a cast of characters, ever so, gotta go, hey yo, pleasure's mine, feeling fine, love you so, feeling low, <coughs> with Mr. Whistler. And um, this is the installation. So these are the characters, and um, just to show you another bit of background, this is a preparation plan before the paintings were even finished as to how they would integrate with the space. So the spatial um, experience of the viewer, as you can see through like the newborn, especially, I think, um, is most often um, very considered in the work. Um, so I'll just run you through these. So I had, basically I had these odd uh, folded kind of panels built for me so that I could paint them. And they're panel constructions of wood. And they're highly beautifully uh, finished with a beautiful white ground that takes quite a bit of preparation. And um, then some staining occurs, and then I had uh, worked with fabrics of different kinds with um, little wires to attach them. And so that's um, the fold heads. Um, so in 2011, um, I was going back wanting to um, get um, my head around my hometown, Victoria, and I started going down to the harbor front. Victoria is a highly uh, touristic city, and it's um, full of tourists, so much so that sometimes you, you feel like you're at a carnival on the streets. So there's this one area of town called um, the Harbor, um, Harbor Front. It's right on the water. And there's a sort of a walkway and tons and tons and tons of tourists. So every, every day at a certain time, I would go down there and sort of hide in the shadows with my sketchbook. And I did like three second sketches of as many of these tourists as I could. So these are some examples. So each one of these little tiny things, it's only about this big, it was like three seconds. 
And I was just fascinated and mesmerized by people. They're, they're so interesting. And of course, everybody was seemed to be having a great time. And so I just collected these. And the result of that was an exhibition called The Giants. Um, now, this is, uh, for me, it was super fun. Um, it's a bit difficult to understand technically if you don't know what was going on, but basically they're um, paper prints. You can see them sort of flopping on the wall. Um, and I, I wanted to show you about that process, because it was quite a process. It's not as if I had decided that's what they would be. So I had the drawings. I did a painting on panel. And um, because I had done that newborn with the lights, I replaced the lights with these glass balls, which you see those two big black dots are actually round uh, Christmas ornaments that I painted. And then I have lighting gels and fabric and paper and stuff, and it's all kind of draped on the, um, the panel that I painted on. And they've all got a big word. The word on this one is buy. And what I found was the physical works themselves, they really weren't that interesting because they were really hard to look at. But I had taken these, um, these photographs of them and they were like more interesting. So I had them printed on um, full scale and uh, then I cut, the, I cut shapes out around them and that was the, the result was these works. So they're very um, confusing in a actively interesting way for the viewer. And this is what you saw in the gallery. Um, here's another example. This is the actual physical thing and then the work itself. This is spelled out Matt. And love ya. Uh, eat. So that's the artwork the physical thing, and that's the paper thing. Um, this is a guy I remember, and this is the work I made of the guy. And I remember this guy, he really did have this really long, greasy suit, like standing straight up and these cool sunglasses. So, um, Keys for My Affection was in 2007, so I guess I'm jumping back a bit. Um, this was following the newborn, um, and I was also with the dummies where I had that Mylar tape. On these ones I was using uh, lighting gels, and then these glass balls. And they were all um, interior spaces, um, two colors, and then they all had a little uh, character in them of some sort of um, mysterious quality, like the magic mirror, like this thing. And this is a drinking um, booth in an old English pub. Uh, with a really cute little dog, and I, I have a really cute little dog now, but I didn't at the time. Um, this is a little Dutch girl in a story, but very, very bright, vivid orange. And um, the rabbit. So you see within the panel, the balls make their own um, facial form. That's a detail to show you the character of what the glass ornament is like within the painting. Okay, so I'm jumping right ahead because um, I want to get through a couple more things. Um, in 2009, I stumbled upon um, two books that ended up having an enormous influence on what I was going to do for the next two years. One book was called The Shingle Style Today, The Historian's Revenge by Vincent Scully, a very well-known um, architectural historian. 
And the other book is called I Am a Strange Loop by Douglas Hofstadner, who's a cognitive scientist and um, mathematician. So um, in Scully's book, this is one of the reproductions I saw in there. And what he, he's talking about in the writing is um, how a particular era of design in North America was all about integrating the inside with the outside. And so that the interior um, living spaces um, merged with the outdoor space. So in this uh, plan, you can, s well, you, you entered sort of the bottom middle, you went into the hall or the parlor, and then the drawing room, but they had these amazing pocket doors that opened out to the piazza, and on the piazza, so the whole ground floor became basically one huge room. I was just fascinated with the idea that um, it was all a precursor to modernism and Frank Lloyd Wright and Vincent Scully um, talked about all of that. Um, but I was so fascinated that I went, that I had to see the building. So I arranged to go to Newport, Rhode Island specifically to see these um, buildings based on that tiny little diagram. Um, and the other book, I Am a Strange Loop, was all about how um, the mind is an extremely complex looping of meanings reflected out. So your mind is reflecting out to the world and the world is reflecting back on your mind and vice versa. So it's a, just a complex spiraling loop of abstractions that go ad infinitum. And um, so basically he's saying you are a reflection of the world and the world is a reflection of you and you are all one and the same thing. And the result of that was these um, paintings called Strange Loop. Um, so I went to Newport, Rhode Island and got permission to go into interiors and um, draw. This is a snapshot I took in one of the rooms that um, this painting is based on. But so you can kind of get an idea of the translation of real experience to painting. And these are some of the other um, mansions that I visited. And the drawing study for the painting and then the actual painting. I'm just speeding up a little so I can get through everything. And so all of the paintings, this one in particular was, um, the left side was um, joy and the right side was sorrow. And they met in the middle with this kind of vortex of um, spirals down into the center of who knows where. Um, this painting is um, 18 feet wide, so it's, it's a very large scale. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of the process of um, in the studio. Um, after the Strange Loop series, um, a lot of things happened in my life, and I ended up um, buying this cute little cottage in Victoria with um, my husband that I was recently married to. And we were gonna move in together because he lived in Seattle and he was gonna immigrate up so we could make a life together. And um, the house, I fell in love with, of all things, the crawl space. So I was like gaga over this crawl space. I couldn't like, talk about anything else. Um, because it had, it was a rock, the house was built on a rock, and it had um, embedded in it the, the technology from 1922 till modern day. So there was a coal burning um, stove down there that originally heated the house, like all kinds of things like that. And um, so I proceeded to document, that was the first thing I did. This is pre-move-in, so since then it's, it's had some changes, but the story is that um, my beloved Paul had cancer and
and um, ten years, ten months later, he w had died. So um, I, this was, I of course, I took a year off for the grieving process. It was um, very, very intense. Um, and after a year, I had taken my photographs of the crawl space and sort of by symbiosis projected um, a model of mortality onto that space. I saw everything down there as if it were a mortal life. And it just sort of automatically happened through this grieving process. Um, and that spurred a research trip to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire so I could look at this amazing um, mural by Orozco. So this was a year later after I had sort of gotten my wits about me and um, decided to make something meaningful out of uh, my grieving process because art, of course, is the only reason to keep going and so I did. Um, I also visited other basements, um, my sister Bonnie's basement. I took tons of photographs. I visited this place, Mohonk Mountain House, and um, took photographs there. And then so the result were many, many studies and um, paintings. So the result was four panorama paintings, each one representing a sort of a phase for me of my experience, and this one is, um, for me, it's breath, rediscovering how to breathe again. Um, I'm just showing you that some of the poses for two. So this is um, red uh, mortality, the basement panoramas, and a couple details of that. So these are, um, this one's 25 feet wide, and they're all six feet high. Um, this one is about insomnia. So it was bright yellow with electric blue. It's hard to photograph so you can see. Um, and then, so in addition to that, um, this was also an element of the work. So um, that was filmed at um, Open Space Gallery in Toronto, where I had the opportunity to um, show all four paintings and the Bones and Golden Road. Um, I'm not sure if I can navigate. show 
found out in Toronto um, in 2014, but in that instance, each painting had its own new, distinct space, and I couldn't show the bones in Boulder Road because there wasn't enough space for them. Um, so I had um, practiced a lot of um, different um, methods for, um, I became quite transformed through that grieving process. It's kind of like I was suddenly awake realizing I, I had a limited amount of time left and, um, you know, death is, makes you wake up. Um, so, um, the last painting I always refer to as transformation, and that was this one, where you have birth on the left side and death on the right side, and they kind of come together in a big vortex, and everything is good, because that's just the way it is. Um, but I had studied a lot of meditation practices, and in one of my meditations, um, I had a vision that a being, a, a bright yellow cloaked being approached me um, and came right up in front of me, and that was the, the spurring of the bones and golden robes, so that's how they came about. And then that in itself spurred on the next work, um, that I have on exhibition right now in Toronto called All to All. So, um, yeah, this is an ideal because I did want to have that slideshow, but um, I don't know how to get back in my thoughts. have to go through the whole thing again. That's the drag. Or now I can go backwards. What do I mean? Okay, I'll just go backwards. <laughs> okay, so upstairs now we have the bones of golden robes, but they're different. And we have clocks, but they're unclocks. And we have spinning biscuit tins that make a racket of noise. And we have ego discs that represent the ego. So um, the ego is a necessary um, player, but it's really a drag. So they're really heavy, and they're in three sizes, small, medium, or large. You can take your pick. And then they're the mystics. Um, and these are all very mystical. Um, experiences they're based on, and then they're the elevators. The elevators um, do exactly that. So um, this is kind of a gist of, of what it looks like, is um, this thing. And so as a final um, part of my presentation for you, I made a video, um, and I only put the, um, noisemakers in the video um, so far, but it's a work in progress. Um, I, so I just wanted to hear you, you to hear the noise and see some of the, um, a bit of the visual.
talk for 15 minutes. And it's, it's a very continuous, immersive um, sound that comes from that. Um, just in um, what started all to all after um, thinking about the bones and golden robes, in 2014, I read um, Einstein's biography by Walter Isaacson. And um, I also did a week-long course in intuition mastery, where I learned um, various basic, very, very practices in accessing the conscious mind. So I use the word conscious mind where it's often interchanged for unconscious mind, but I think of it more as the basic seat of consciousness. So they teach things like um, self-hypnosis, um, various meditation practices, uh, channeling, dream teaming, and um, even mystical practices. And I also done a lot of reading in um, ancient Eastern, more religious, spiritual um, practices and meditation. And there's a lot of overlap even now between modern ideas about um, cognition is a rapidly expanding field in studies of the brain in relationship to um, what meditation can do or how it does operate in the brain. And Einstein's biography taught me that um, he wrote everything down. Every little spark of an idea, he wrote it on a scrap of paper. And so I started doing that and putting them all, hole punching them all, and putting them in a big notebook. Einstein took naps, and oftentimes he awoke with um, clarity. And another thing that fascinated me about his life was he walked to work in the patent office. This was in his early years. He walked to work through the Zurich train station. And so if you think about a train station, it has parallel tracks, trains with lights, and clocks, and a schedule. And so he uh, modeled his whole theory of the quantum world in relationship to trains passing in deep outer space, trains passing at rapid speed with lights going in different directions, people on each train, would they be in the same time or even when they passed, would they be in different times? And then how fast did light travel? So that whole idea of using your physical environment as a model for very abstract ideas was really fascinating for me. So I thought of um, all to all and options of that combination. So I could have all to all, none to all, all to none, or none to none. And I chose all to all. And I see that work as a, as a kind of a model of um, a new outlook on um, possibilities for quantum practice and qu quantum physics, which I think is um, our next, um, our next world. We're, we're still Newtonian, basically, but I think uh, we're going to break through. I mean, we already have, but not 100%. Um, yeah, so I think that's it.